<laughs> well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's so good to see you. I'm glad you're here because I've got somebody I want you to meet. As a matter of fact, in the next several weeks, I'm hoping we all get to know him really, really well. Today, I want to introduce you to a young man named David. His story unfolds during a time of real crisis in his homeland of Israel. The nation was experiencing a leadership crisis. God had fired Israel's king, King Saul, for insubordination. However, Saul still sat on the throne, still wore the crown, still had the title, but God wasn't helping him anymore. God wasn't even speaking to him anymore. Uh, Israel had a king who was completely out of touch with God. Now that's a leadership crisis. However, none of this had caught God off guard. Before God fired Saul, he had already searched for and found Saul's replacement. And so consequently, God had already started the process of removing Saul and replacing him with a new king. And what do we know about the new guy? When God informed Saul that he had chosen his replacement, he told him something about the next king. He said, he's a man after my own heart, and he's better than you. <laughs> he's a man after my own heart, and he's better. What does it mean? Let me give you the Hodge translation, okay? This is what God essentially said to Saul. Saul, your replacement is better than you because he's different from you. Uh, Saul, you love yourself more than anything. He loves me more than anything. Saul, your greatest desire in life is to please yourself. His greatest desire is to please me. And just where did God find Saul's replacement? Did he find him under Saul's roof? Was he a member of the royal family? Did he find him somewhere in the political arena? Was he a rising star in Saul's government? Did he find him on the cover of Forbes magazine? Was he a successful businessman? Did he find him in the prophetic or rabbinical schools? Was he a protege of the great spiritual leader Samuel? Where did God find Israel's next king? He found him in a field. Sitting outside the small town of Bethlehem. Let me tell you the story. When the story unfolds, there's an old man by the name of Samuel who is front and center. He is broken hearted. His cheeks may have been wet with tears. His eyes kind of puffy from crying. He hadn't laughed in a long time. He may not have been weeping at the moment. Perhaps he's just sitting in a chair staring off into space. He's been in mourning for a long, long time. You say, what about? He, better than anybody, knew what had happened to Saul. That Saul had crossed a line with God, and God had relieved him of his responsibilities. And he also, he saw not only what had happened, but he saw all that could have happened if Saul had just remained faithful to God. All of this broke his heart. Samuel was very, very close to God. God very close to Samuel. And God spoke to Samuel. Whenever God spoke to Samuel, Samuel heard exactly what he said. And this is what he said, you've mourned long enough. I've given you adequate time. Certainly it was, you had something to, be, to grieve over, but you've mourned long enough. I've rejected Saul. Settled, done. And it's time to look more toward his replacement. 
He said, I want you to get a flask and I want you to fill it with olive oil. Now, what in the world was a flask full of olive oil going to be for? Well, there was a ceremony prior to each king uh, taking the throne called the anointing. And uh, Samuel was going to be entrusted with the responsibility of anointing the next king. And by anointing him, they would pour the oil over their head. And the oil represented the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit setting that man apart for a divine office. But it also represented this power of the Spirit. In other words, you're not just being set apart for this, but God's going to empower you or enable you to do what He has called you to do. So He said, get a flask and fill it with oil. And He said, I want you to go to the town of Bethlehem. He said, I want you to find a man named Jesse because I've chosen one of his sons to be the next king. And I'm going to show you which one it is. And when I do, I want you to anoint him. Now, how do you suppose Samuel responded to this? Samuel kind of objected. He said, if I do that, if I do what you're telling me to do, King Saul is going to kill me. Was that an exaggeration? No, not at all. God had already told Saul, you're out. i got another man chosen. We're going to be putting him in your place. Saul was in a bad state of mind already, emotionally and spiritually. He was angry. He was volatile. He was suspicious. And Samuel knew that if he finds out I'm anointing the next guy, he will kill me. God said, well, I'll tell you what you're going to do then. I want you to go get yourself a cow. <laughs> and I want you to take that cow with you to Bethlehem. And when you get there and somebody says, what's your business here? You tell them this, I've come to worship God by offering this cow as a sacrifice to him. And he said, and so this wasn't a made up, it wasn't a fabricated to try to protect him. That's exactly what he was going to do. And God said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to invite Jesse and his sons to this worship service. So Samuel did exactly as God said. He got his flask of oil, he got his cow, and he made his way to Bethlehem. Now, when he gets to Bethlehem and the elders of the town hear that Samuel's in town, I want you to understand, it unnerved them. They were terrified that the preacher had come to their town. You say, why in the world was that? Well, he was a prophet of God, and often when Samuel showed up, it was, it was to deliver some warning from God, some message of gloom and doom. And so their first thought was, we must have done something wrong, or the preacher wouldn't have showed up. So God, is everything okay? And I think there was another thing about Samuel. He wasn't your stereotypical pastor. Yeah, as a preacher, I tell you what really chaps my hide, and that's the way that pastors are portrayed on television and in movies. You know, I, I really had, uh, I really kind of despised the pastor on Little House on the Prairie. i got to be honest with you. They're always made out to be these super passive guys, a little bit effeminate. You know, they just take anything. They never, You know the preacher that I liked in, in movies? I liked Clint Eastwood playing the preacher in Pale Rider. You know what? <laughs> that's who I liked. And uh, if I'm frustrated, I watch that, and I see him beating these people with axe handles, and I go, man, that's the way it ought to be right there. <laughs> you don't attend, come in the office, I got my axe handle ready. <laughs> Sammy was kind of like Clint Eastwood, and they knew that just recently he killed an Amalekite king named Agag, and he didn't just kill him, he chopped him into pieces. And so they're thinking, oh my God, what have we done, and what's this old man going to do to us? They said, did you come in peace? He said, yeah, I just, dudes, I just came to worship. That's all I came for. I'm going to sacrifice this cow. I'm going to worship God. He even invited them. And he said, you know, you can join me. And he encouraged them to go through the purification process. Don't know exactly what that meant. But in other words, it meant this. You better clean up before you come to worship. And I don't think he was talking about physically. I think he was talking about spiritually. And he said, assume, I think he assumed they knew how to do that. Well, then he goes and he finds Jesse. And Brian, he must have told Jesse what his business was. God has chosen one of your boys. I believe it's kind of on the down low. God's chosen one of your boys to be the next king. 
And he's going to show me who it is. And I'm going to anoint him. And here's what you're going to do. You're going to come to my worship service tonight. You're going to be there when I sacrifice this cow to God. And then at some point during the evening, uh, God's going to show me and this anointing is going to take place. And so Jesse must have told his eight sons, you're not going to believe this. Samuel, this would have been like Billy Graham. Samuel has invited us to church with him tonight. You know, as a matter of fact, just the elders of the town and us. Now we've got to clean up we've got to dress up we've got to present ourselves as best we can and I believe we're scrubbing I believe they were putting on their suits they're tightening their ties all eight of them including the youngest his name was David and all of a sudden Jesse goes come here son come here uh, I guess I've given you the impression that we're all going. I apologize, but you ain't going. I'm taking the rest of the boys, but I'm going to need somebody to watch the sheep and the goats tonight. And you're going to do that. I can almost hear Jesse going, now, son, son, listen, listen. You know the purpose of this. God's chosen one of my sons to be the king. He's going to reveal that to Samuel. It's going to be anointed tonight. And I can almost hear him say, and David, you know that can't be you. So do this for your dad. Do this for your brothers. So I see David taking his suit and tie back off. He puts on his shepherd's garb. He gets his shepherd's bag, his sling, his staff. And he goes and gets those sheep and those goats. And he walks out into the night, into the desert night, just he and the animals. Well, Jesse and the rest go to this big anointing shindig. I guess you call it a king selection party I'm not sure that the elders showed up because there's no mention of them and apparently after the sacrifice was made and they had worshipped God Samuel looked at Jesse and said bring them out one by one so Jesse apparently turns to the obvious choice. It was his oldest son. His name was Eliab, and he was a stunning specimen of manhood. I, I tell you who I picture. I picture an, an eastern LeBron James. Huge. I mean, tall, big, strong. He was already in Saul's army. He had military experience. I mean, I think Jesse's just thinking he's the obvious choice. Here you go, Samuel. Samuel took one look at him and said, Dang, that's got to be him. And then God spoke up and said, Uh-uh, that's not him. I want you to look at a verse with me. It's 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse number 7. And this is what, but the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. In other words, listen, nothing personal. He's just not my choice. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. I want to read that verse because we're going to come back next week. And we're really going to park right there and we're going to talk about some things. But God said, you're just looking at this all wrong. Samuel said to Jesse, pass send the next one so he turns to the next guy next son he comes parading out and immediately God said no Samuel turns to Jesse mm -mm. here comes the third one God said no Samuel turns to Jesse mm -mm. I'm saying they go through all seven nope 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 Samuel is totally confused God told him it's one of his sons and then God just told him it's none of them the old man kind of gets it figured out. He looks at Jesse and said, You got any more boys? 
He said, well, there's the youngest, uh, David. Where is he? He's sitting out in the middle of a field with a bunch of sheep and goats. He said, well, you send somebody after him. We're not proceeding until David gets here. Picture old David sitting out in the dark by himself, probably feeling kind of sorry for himself. And he hears footsteps coming, and then all of a sudden a voice, David, daddy wants you at the church. Now, in my mind, you know what I think David thought? Well, they must be through with their little party, and they need somebody to clean up their mess, and I guess that's why they're calling me. Now, it's not in your Bible, but that is in the Hodge translation. <laughs> he goes with them. I don't think he's expecting anything. He comes walking through. Listen, the Bible said he was, I love the ways to try. He was handsome. With beautiful eyes. And dark skin. He goes walking into the room and God said to Samuel, I love the way he said this, that's the one. Anoint him. That's the one. Anoint him. So Samuel brings him front and center. Tradition says that he poured this olive oil over his head. He whispered in his ear, you're the next king. Jesse knew it. The seven brothers knew it. Samuel knew it. And now David knew it. And the Bible said that as the oil poured down his body, the Spirit of God came on him in power. And from that day forward, God worked in him powerfully and through him powerfully. And after this little anointing celebration, Samuel left Jesse and his sons and he returned to his home. Now, what do we learn in this story? i got to be frank with you. Lots. There's so many lessons to be learned in this and so many I want to share and so many I have already written down and thought about. And Early this morning, out of the blue, God said, table those thoughts. Table them. You may come back to them later, but here's one thing I want you to make sure people get out of this. Life can get better in a hurry. Life can get a whole lot better in a very short period of time. You see where you're getting at? Most of you have already seen it. Try to, let's try to put ourselves in David's place here for a moment. Samuel has invited your dad and all your brothers, including you, to this once-in-a-lifetime event for any family. And your daddy looks at you and says, oh, yeah, you can't go. What? You can't go. I'm going. Your brothers are going. But you're not going. You know, what he's, you know what just happened to him? He's been uh, rejected. He is not included. As a matter of fact, he is intentionally excluded. By whom? His family. His own dad. When he's out there sitting in the dark, I think he's uh, hurting. Because doesn't rejection sting? I mean, not just sting. Sometimes rejection just guts us. I believe he's sitting out there hurting. I think he's feeling left out, overlooked, on the outside looking in, forgotten. But I'll tell you what hurt him worse. They're not being able to attend this party. He heard what his daddy said. I got a whole lot more confidence in your seven brothers than I got in you. If one of you boys is going to be the king, I don't know who it is, but I do know this. It's not you. I'm telling you, that had to devastate him. 
I believe he walked out there with those sheep and goats and sat down and had himself a big pity party, John. I think he was hurting. I think he was sad. I think he was lonely. I, I do. I think he was terribly confused. I think he was asking this question, why me? I mean, of all the eight brothers, I mean, if, if, no, if somebody's got to do this, why me? But I think he's asking another question. Why not me? If God was going to bless one of, the, one of my brothers, one of Jesse's sons, if he was going to bless them by making the king, why not me? Why wouldn't God do something like that for me? I think this was a, I'll tell you what I know. I know this was a low moment in his life. And I'm going to bet you this, Brian. I bet you it may have been the lowest moment in his young life. Can you relate? Because some of you can. It's not a stretch for you to relate to him. Because you're still reeling from the blunt of some kind of rejection. You know how painful that is. You've had someone in your world that should have had confidence in you that you've just discovered has zero confidence in you. Somebody should have believed in you and they don't believe in you and that's pretty obvious to, to you now. You have been excluded from something, some circle, You have been banished in, into the darkness. You feel overlooked, forgotten. You live every day under the crushing weight of loneliness. You have spent hour after hour ans asking questions you're not getting answers to. Why me? Why me? And sometimes what might be worse, why not me? You look around and see God doing things for other people. You see how he's blessing other people. You have prayed that he would do this for you and he's not answering those prayers and you're sitting out there in the darkness going, why not me? You're in a low spot. It might just be the lowest spot you've ever been in. Well, I got good news for you. Life can get better in a hurry. David's sitting there, man, sulking, pouting, lonely, sad. When all of a sudden somebody shows up. It was, probably had to be the worst day of his life. And Jimmy, just like that, it turned into the best day of his life. Somebody came and got him and said, Dad, won't you? He walks in there, Doc, and realizes something. I'm going to be a king. You know what? They left me out. God had big, they didn't have any plans. God had big plans. I'm telling you, just like that, he goes from this lonely, broken-hearted shepherd to the next king of Israel. I want to tell you something. Life got better for him in a hurry. I see that lesson. Wow, I got 12 minutes, man. I might just take some long pauses for effect here to kind of stretch this out to 10.30. This is something I see all the way through the Bible. Are you familiar with the story of Joseph? He lived a 13-year-long nightmare. Ends up in a prison serving a life sentence for something he didn't do. For every one day he turns around and he was... And some of the guards from Pharaoh's court came and got him. And they said, Pharaoh wants to talk to you. You know what he didn't know at the time? Uh, life just got a whole lot better for me like that. Uh, last year, we studied a lady named Ruth. She was living below the poverty level. And one day, she woke up with an idea. I guess I'll have to sign up for the welfare program here in Israel. So she goes down to this set of fields, and she's basically got to pick up what the poor miss. And there she met a, na a man named Boaz. She didn't see it at first. Her life just got better. 
in a hurry. Just like that. I think about the disciples after Christ's crucifixion, you know, cowering in a room, terrified, broken-hearted, confused. They open the door, and there's a woman standing there. She said, I've just been to Jesus' tomb, and thought you guys might want to know there ain't nobody in it. Life just got better. In a hurry. Now, one of these long pauses for emphasis. Got it, got it. Listen to me. God often spoke to Samuel so that he could speak to somebody else. They were called prophetic sermons. God said, here's the message. It's for them. Give it to them. Now, as I meditated on this, he did that to me. He said, I got a simple sermon, a simple message, a simple word for you to share. We're going to go to church. Here it is. There are better days ahead. I don't know who that's for. There's somebody here sitting in the dark, lonely, confused, and hurting. And as God's message to you, there's better days ahead. You know why? Because life can get better in a hurry. So in light of that, I'm going to encourage you to do something. Don't give up. Don't you give up. Don't you give up hope. Don't you give up on God. Don't you give up on life. Don't you give up. Don't give up today because you've got no idea what tomorrow may hold. Because life can get better in a hurry. You have no way of knowing this. Today might be the worst day you ever lived. Tomorrow might be the best. Let me pray for you. You ask, I wonder who that message was for. It might be for you. Or it might be for you. I want you to embrace it as God's prophetic word to you. There are better days ahead. There are better days ahead. There are better days ahead. Don't you give up now. Father, thank you for your word, for your presence, for your constant encouragement for knowing where we are and when we've just come to the end of ourselves and we need a little boost you're so faithful God you're just so faithful to give us the right words at the right time I know that I'm talking to somebody here that's tired lonely confused I pray that nothing else to leave here today with hope hope and this is what I pray that the winds of their life will soon shift. 
And instead of fighting that headwind, they've been fighting so, so long that the wind will be at their back, fill their sails, and propel them along through better times. In Christ's name, we pray this together. Amen. Thank you for being here. You're dismissed.